This event is in partnership with Power. Thank you so much to Power for being here today. And um, it is also part of the Asia House Bargain Foundation Literature Festival. Um, Power will be speaking at the end about their charitable mission and explaining how you can donate and support the organization. Um, I'm just gonna make a few quick opening remarks. Um, this is the first week of our festival and we're running until the 6th of November with a few events every week. Um, so please do check out our program on asiahousearts.org or pick up a program downstairs. If you'd like to tweet today, we're at Asia House Arts, not to be confused with Asia House UK, and the hashtag is hashtag Asia Lit Fest. Um, I'd like to once again say a big thank you to Power, who are our partner today. Um, they've kindly sponsored the tea, coffee and pastries that you've all enjoyed earlier. Um, and as I said, they'll say a few words about their charitable mission at the end of this talk. So please allow me to introduce the speakers to you this morning. Michelle Hussain is one of the presenters of BBC Radio 4's Influential Today programme and the television news on BBC One. In 20 years in journalism, she has worked on big international as well as British stories and has become known for interviewing, presenting on location and for critically acclaimed documentaries. Her work has taken her from Davos to Rohingya refugee camps and from interviewing prime ministers to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Michelle has been named by the Sunday Times as one of the 500 most influential people in Britain and has won several awards, including Broadcaster of the Year at the 2015 London Press Club Awards and Presenter of the Year at the 2015 Women in Film and TV Awards. Um, Michelle will be in conversation with B. Rolat, who is a writer and broadcast journalist. Her award-winning book, In Search of Mary, was described by the Nobel Laureate and Martia Sen as terrific, quite unlike anything I've read before. She co-wrote the best-selling Talking About Jane Austen in Baghdad and is one of the writers in Virago's Fifty Shades of Feminism. B has chaired panel events and flagship events at literature and history festivals ranging from Jaipur and Hay to Chalk Valley and Glastonbury. She began her journalism career in the BBC World Service and has written for The Telegraph, Mail, Guardian and Vogue India, who named her as their girl crush and star of the show. B has worked in Iraq, India, Colombia, Russia and Palestine at, and is chair of Mary on the Green, the campaign to memorialise Mary Wollstonecraft. There'll be a chance at the, um, throughout the conversation for you to ask your questions. Um, if you haven't bought Michelle's amazing book already, it is on sale in the next room, in this room. And Michelle will be signing copies of the book at the end of this talk as well. Um, so, and for those of you who are staying throughout the day, um, our cafe opens at 12, so you can get lunch at that point. So, please give, me a, please give a really warm welcome to Michelle and B. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Anna. And thanks, Asia House, and thanks, Bagra Foundation, and to Power also. Um, my name's B. Rolat, and I've just come back from living from three and a half years in India. Um, and I came back in time for Michelle's book, because why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, they, this is why we're here. We know her face. We definitely know her voice, because there's only one civilised way to get up in the morning in this country, and it's listening to Radio Ford's flagship Today programme, preferably with Michelle at the mic. Um, so we know all these, but do we know the skills that enabled this career? Well, we're about to. You really do have to buy this book, but today's our chance to explore it, and we'll be welcoming questions from the floor. And I'd like you to look at this as the idea of, you know, a very, very busy and very successful friend taking a morning out of their schedule to, to turbocharge your career. <laughs> Think of it that way, you know. Can you get us all a pay rise, Michelle? That would be great. Um, <laughs> I can add to the Anna's list of accolades, because um, I used to work at the BBC, and I know a few of her old colleagues, so naturally... Okay. Now I'm dreading this. Naturally, I, I asked speaking around, to. and, uh, you know, what's she like? And? Not a bad word. Everyone loves you. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad that the vet, I vetted the list of. She's the, she, she's the Michael Palin of news. And I just, as an opening gambit, I wanted to ask you. I mean, was that a decision that you made? Because trust me, not all presenters are like that. Is that a decision you made? To be what? To be not horrific. <laughs> 
Wow, I'm sort of now worrying about the presenters you've worked with over the years, B. Can I just say right at the start, hello to everyone also sitting over there. Thank you for being here. I hope you get a decent view on the, uh, on the screen. But I'm really honoured that, um, that all of you are here this morning. This book is a whole new journey for me because, you know, my day job obviously is asking people's questions and getting other people's stories out. So it's a very unusual experience for me to be talking about myself. And this book ended up being much more personal than I had imagined because I realized that, you know, some of it is, some of it, uh, some of the skills that I talk about are things that have worked for me. Some of them even today are things that I wish I did more of. Um, but the process of writing it just meant that I had to really take, um, you know, a, a, a really cold, hard look back at my own career. And I hope I've been honest about the things that have uh, gone wrong as well as the things that I'm, that I'm proud of. So, um, I guess a lot of the things did come from journalism in the sense that the more I thought about what I had learned from presenting, the more I realized that there are aspects of that that are really relevant and useful to any line of work at any stage of life. Because we live in an age of very short attention spans. We all have a limited time to be heard. And um, because, because my starting point is, is effective communication, um, I, there, there, there was a lot that I wanted to share around that, but it ended up being broader than that as well. Well, this is, this is the founding quote. You say, the more I thought about what I consider to be some of the essential tools of my trade, speech, choice of words, body language, distilling information and deploying facts, the more I saw them as key to being effective in any line of work and at any stage of life, which is quite interesting because one of your front cover quotes says, I wish I'd read this when I was 20. But the fact is that all careers are now works in progress. Yes, and, and, and I also realized that, you know, you have to be able to make a pitch for yourself throughout your career. I mean, obviously, at, in the beginning of your career, you know, you're focusing on getting on the ladder, but then there are so many stages over that. And I think in women's lives, just by the nature of what we are, there are likely to be more tricky transitions in and out of the workplace. You know, coming back from maternity leave, taking time out, just juggling the childcare and the family. And I think that just can mean that you need more of this than, uh, you know, than most men in the workplace are likely to need. Although I think the future of work is likely to challenge that because everyone is going to have much more disrupted, uh, disrupted careers. And, you know, there are, there are good and bad things in that. Um, but, but yeah, I really started to think about what are, you know, what are the ways in which you can, some of it is about boosting your personal presence, but certainly a lot of it is around, is around messaging and the way you put yourself forward. And I realize, you know, as a journalist, I realize that I'm generally better at telling other people's stories than telling my own. And that's not just true in journalism, it's true of all of us, that a lot of us, are comfortable asking other people about what they do. We're comfortable probably talking about our work, but the minute it comes to putting ourselves forward, I think a lot of us struggle with that. And the trouble is that we need to find the ways to struggle less with that, because um, if you don't do justice to yourself and what you have to offer, you are demanding a lot of the other party in that conversation. So what do you the, mean? Can you give I an mean, example? I mean, you know, the job interviewer, I think that, you know, you're going into a, to a setting like an interview or an appraisal. And if you don't, you know, things can always go wrong in that setting. And I'm not saying that there's a magic list of things that will, that will prevent that ever happening. But you really want to minimize the chances of you walking out of that particular encounter thinking, I really wish I had said that one of the key things I needed to say was such and such, and I just didn't do it. And I think certainly, you know, many of us uh, in this room um, come from a nation background. I think for me, I think there was an element of my background that where I've been brought up to be, you know, understated and modest about what I've done that actually did prevent me then putting myself forward to the extent that I have needed to at different stages. So I've had to learn to do this over time, and a lot of it I wish I had learned earlier on. Mm. Can you tell me about the, the, uh, this idea of uh, the, the two horizons? I found that interesting. Yes, so I, you know, I, I just, when I look back to uh, when I first joined the BBC, and I was desperate to work in journalism, and particularly desperate to work at the BBC, and, um, and when I entered the organisation, I, I was just so happy to be there that nothing beyond the day job in the newsroom mattered to me. I didn't hmm. have any sense of where I wanted to go uh, later on. Although I start, now when I look back, I realized that I did at various stages have sort of one eye 
um, on, a, on a horizon further ahead. And I think one of the things that's really worth doing is having a sense of a twin horizon, because you don't want to be the person who spends so much time thinking about the dream job that they end up distracted and not very good at what they do now. So because is it a twin horizon in the sense of, you know, uh, with, a, with a time break? I suppose with How a time break. You? I suppose in most, I mean, for me, I've generally found that five years is kind of a good thing. Like, what do you want to do in five years' time is quite a good horizon because it's not too far away. It's, you know, reasonably within, within view. Um, but I, 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 the reason I, I say about being good at what you do now is that I've, I've learned over time that if you're the kind of person who is constantly dreaming about something far away and it does distract you from what you're doing now, you are un probably unlikely to be given more responsibility. So your best chance at thinking, you know, in, uh, years ago, someone in the BBC said to me, oh, a, a producer said to me, I really want to be a presenter one day. And I thought to myself, you know, you're not that exacting in the work that you do as a producer. And so the chances of someone giving you more editorial responsibility are less as a result of that. So I think the, the twin horizon, I think, also helps you just remember you have to pull the stops out at what you're doing now mm. and at the same time have an eye on the future. But, you know, just not to... Not, not to just coast or take your eye off the ball mm. of what you're doing now. And can we talk about nerves and fear? We can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you do that. We can. Because one of the reasons that I wrote the book was that invariably when I went to speak in schools in particular, and this would be said by teenage boys as well as teenage girls, but often people would say, you must never get nervous doing what you do. And, I, and this question started to really bother me because I thought if people are really thinking, well, a certain kind of person who never gets nervous is the kind of person who ends up doing a job like that, um, that is a problem for society because too many people are then excluding themselves out of that uh, in, entirely. And so I've written this at a point where I feel able to be quite honest about the fact that, you know, I, although I'm much more comfortable and at ease going on air with the Today programme now than I was when I started, and certainly for the first three years. Um, you know, I do worry about what's coming up, and I think that I've... Actually, I, I know that when I feel that, it's actually, for me, it's a good thing. It means I, I harness that energy, I channel it and what I need to do, and it really makes me... It makes me stop sitting at my desk daydreaming because I know, you know, I have to deliver and I have to concentrate as hard as I can on the next thing that's coming up. But what does it mean, the harnessing and the channeling of, well, of nervous energy? I mean, I just think that for, for me that now when I feel those nerves and that sort of free song of worry... Are you nervous now? No, not now, not now, but... but just I wait, I've got some really that, horrible questions. Yeah, well, I know, I don't, I don't know what's coming. Just kidding. But uh, no, because I feel this is... The reason I feel comfortable saying this is because you know, I think it's an important message to get across, and I want to share it with all of you, which is that, I, you know, I, I dislike the whole, uh, you know, any, any kind of these sort of superhuman, superwoman kind of tags, because I think they just are, you know, they're, they're not true the vast majority of the time, and they're really the opposite of empowering and helpful to, to other people. So, but, you know, most mornings before I go on air, I will, you know, not be worrying about the whole thing, but there'll be certain points where I think I really, I know I need to think more about that. And, you know, it's, it's almost a triage process where you're working out, you know, what I can do with relative ease and what I really need to dig deeper into. So okay. um, I just find it, um, you know, just helps me concentrate. And I think, again, we live in an age where so many things are coming at us all the time we need those strategies to, so that we can zero in on the things that really matter. To focus in. And actually, yeah. it's really nice that one of your goals, quite obviously, is, is to be helpful, to be useful. And um, I'm actually going to demonstrate something from the book now, so please watch, because I'll, I'll test you afterwards. <laughs> I demonstrated four things from your book there. What were they? <laughs> well, you know, in my... OK, so I've got a chap from the book that is about body language. And I, I, when I started to think about body language and nonverbal communication... You've done I, the politician's trick. I don't think you would let the, the question... Yeah. That I haven't answered the question. I'll, I'll help with you I'll if get you want. There. I okay, promise okay, I'll okay. get there. But the, 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 I started... I realised that because I work with words, over the years I have sat and I've 
agonized over my scripts before going on air, but I've given very little thought to, you know, how I stand, where I look. And sort of some of that comes naturally. But equally, there are so many really obvious things that, you know, if you sit in a, in a, in a meeting and you'll sit, I mean, if I was sitting back like this, there's obviously a very different message I'm, I'm giving across. If I'm sort of turning away from B and sort of sitting like this, I'm also sending a different message. And even on and microphone, on the radio, if you slump, it, it does. Also true. Yeah. Also true that the way that you, you know, some of it is just sort of, you know, basic stuff that you need to sort of have that sort of open position and, you know, look people in the eye and show people that you're, that you're listening to them. But, you know, we all see how many messages people send about, um, about, uh, about themselves without realizing and without wanting to make everyone super self-conscious. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of meetings I've been in where I've thought, you know, that person could be sending a much better, atten a much better message about their attention and their interest in this um, to the other people in the room, including some who will be important to that person's yeah. career, that, and they just don't realise it. So what I did was open my arms to occupy space, yeah. I leant forwards, and I looked... Yeah from the left to the right in the middle. And also the power pause. You I like all of that naturally. Like, sure. Come know, on. It's, you know, it's worth noticing. Love thinking she got it from the book, but it's, it's not true. I got it from the book. It's worth noticing. And the power pause, you know, it was, I think it's Christine Lagarde that you talked to yeah. that talks about slowing down and introducing pauses. These things yes. are very powerful. Well, she, Christine Lagarde um, has, has said, once said that she's, she's in a lot of very male dominated settings. Um, by nature of what she does. And she says there are times when she sees a woman take the floor, uh, start to speak, and the attention of the men in the room goes down a few notches. Turns come out. <laughs> so, but I think that obviously there are many settings where it is, and I'm on plenty of conference stages where there will be very few women. In fact, sometimes I'm the only woman and there's a whole panel of men. That still, that still happens. And I'm also in some settings which, um, I mean, I remember being in Davos in, a, in, in one session uh, with the Iranian president and there was a room full of this, a uh, room this large, and there were uh, probably with more people in it than this room, and there were about 10 women in the, in the whole room. So there are settings in which you can really feel yourself in a minority, and I still have to remind myself that I have a right to be there too. And so I think, you know, some of that is an, is an internal message. Um, but I think, yes, you know, occupying, occupying space. I mean, we're sitting down now because we're in conversation. But if I was giving a talk, I would always like to do it standing up. And, you know, it was part of the reason I wanted to say hello to everyone there, because it's terrible if someone, you know, you just find that you're looking at the side of their head and they just haven't noticed that, that you're there at all. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's really important when you're addressing uh, a group or a gathering. Okay. One of the things I really love about the book is that it's very upbeat. It's very, it's very sort of ambitious and, it, and, it, and it's encouraging. Um, if I had hesitation, it would be that perhaps people are going to read this book may very well be on that journey. You know, it's like a sort of valediction speech in a really ambitious girls' school where you think they're probably doing all right. What about girls who might not read this book, aren't considering so much a career as a job? Yep. Probably a part-time job, low-income. You know, there's this yep. big schism between careers and jobs. And, you know, do, do, how can you ensure that your book reaches those girls? Well, I mean, obviously, I would love it to reach those who, you know, probably aren't in a setting where they are exposed to role models or they, you know, they may not have supportive families or they may be the kind of schools where, you know, a teacher might not be telling them, you know, you, you should go for whatever it is. I think that's, um, that's, who I would really love, you know, picks it up and takes something from it. And I, and I mean that, you know, I, equally, I think that applies to, to boys as well. Um, but I think one of the things that, that really, that, that I just feel strongly about is that these are things that, you know, we know people, even very successful people, who you can see, actually, they are, you know, they, they could turn things up a notch or two by doing some very basic things, whether it's, you know, they might be, missing some social skills that could make a big difference or, you know, there might be that extra element that's missing. So I think it depends how much I am quite a self-critical person and uh, I, I think there are, you know, I'm not necessarily recommending that because it can make life quite uncomfortable in many ways. But I've learned over time that there are, there's a time and a place for who you confide in about doubt about yourself. And I think that I do see a lot of people at, you know, I, and I still do this on occasion now, but it's one of the things I really try not to do is that there have been a number of times when I have 
you know, someone has said to me, that was a really good interview, and I've said, do you think so? And then, you know, and I really try and make myself aware of that now, because I think, actually, I'm questioning the other person's judgment. They have told me that was a good interview. I may actually think to myself, I really wish I'd asked a different question, or I wish I hadn't said that. But depending on who they are, it's really not necessarily something that that particular person needs to know. So, so what should you say? Well, yes, I think most brilliant. of the time you can just say thank you. you know, yeah. I mean, you don't have to turn into, you know, you know some kind of bombastic character who just goes around going, yes, I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> OK, I want to turn back to the book. There was a, a bit that really jumped out at me, having recently returned from India. There was a, something about India that I got very obsessed with when I was living there, and you've got exactly the right person as well, Professor Rohini Pandey, who is an expert in... Uh, she's done a lot of work around the data on female participation in the workforce in South Asia. Um, she demonstrated that in India, women's participation in the labour market is, has dropped uh, from 37% down to 28% between 1990 and 2015. This was a real conundrum for yeah. me when I was out there. But in the course of some of the conversations that I had, it was presented to me that I was being a white feminist and that you know, we were too obsessed with kind of corporate, uh, women in the corporate sphere, and that, that, you know, that was a very much a Western fixation. Yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I think that there are, those figures on India are really interesting for two reasons. One is, of course, we make an assumption that once you have a certain, uh, and th this is a sort of note to self about progress everywhere, that you cannot take future progress mm. um, on, any, uh, on pretty much any dimension or any matrix of, of equality for granted. So a certain number of, a certain, once you get to a certain proportion of women in the workforce or minorities in a world, whatever it is that you're looking at, you should not make the assumption that that trajectory continues. And in India, the, the opposite has happened. I think it also really brought home to me how social norms and, and you know, part of the reason that those figures exist in India is, is because of particularly entrenched social norms. But I think part of what I put in the book is that in societies absolutely everywhere, I'm not putting forward to women that you do these things and you will necessarily progress because I'm very conscious and I became increasingly conscious over the course of writing this book that there are so many perceptions that exist in society when you compare women and men and when you just different ways that we talk about women and men um, we we tend to notice and register much more what a woman is like as a person as well as how she is in terms of her uh, competence or her academic capability. We tend to comment on whether a woman is helpful, friendly, nice, all those kinds of and things. And that's across the board. That's anywhere you across go. Across the board. And it's really evidence. There's one um, piece of research that I put in my book, which comes from real world students' ratings of, their, uh, of male and female academics. Um, uh, primarily in the United States, and it, it just look, and this is an online searchable database which you can find on, on the internet very easily, where you can tap in a particular word and you can see if it comes up uh, in the students' ratings more frequently for their male professors than their female ones. Genius, brilliant, all come up more often for male <laughs> academics. Nice, friendly, all those sort of personal characteristics come up much more often um, for women. So I think we have to be aware as women and men that you know, all of this exists, and, and we may well come up against it. What I mean by that is that, you know, as you rise through the workplace, um, uh, a woman, when a woman in authority, there's often likely to be a trade-off between how she's perceived as competent and whether she's perceived as warm. Those two things, you know, can often go in opposite directions, whereas for, they don't for men. So I think that, um, so I guess part of what I put forward in the book is an individual, is an individual mission. Part of what I put, put forward is also, you know, where, why, where we haven't got far enough on the structure of the workplace um, and, the, and the, the, the ways that being part-time or taking time out can really count against women in the long run. And, and also part of what I put forward is an awareness of, all, of, of what surrounds us when we grow up female and, and just the different ways in which we can continue to reference and to think about um, women versus men without realizing it. I want to raise one more question, and then I'd like to come to the audience and, and invite you to, to join in. So do have a question ready. But you have mentioned how uncomfortable it is that, you're, that you are in this book. It sort mm. of it strays into memoir territory. Yes. Um, 
It doesn't stray with reckless abandon, though. You know, there's, there is the, you know, the famous BBC impartiality is still very much in evidence. <laughs> it was a very touching tribute to your father, but I was kind of, I was kind of looking for more. Um, After and, I retire. Yeah, oh, right, the, the, the kiss and <laughs> Which tell. Which I hope is a way down the line. <laughs> But um, I just, I wanted to know, you're, you're a flag bearer as, you know, woman on the BBC, woman on the Today programme, but also, you know, you quote your, your, your Muslim heritage, your grandmother's heritage, mm -hmm. your mother and father. And I know that you were moved in, I think it was 2014, to join the Not In My Name campaign. I just wondered if, you know, how much representing is it, can you do? I mean, did, did, how much of your personality did you want to put in this? Mm by way of, you know, almost being an ambassador. And is that a burden? Well, I, I think I don't see it exactly like that, but I did struggle with how personal the, the book, um, uh, how personal I wanted the book to be. And I think some of how personal it became was just by virtue of circumstance, because I lost my father in the right in the middle of writing it. And, and for, you know, for, for several weeks, maybe a few months, I did absolutely nothing. Um, I didn't write a single word. And, and when I started to write again, I, um, I ended up writing, and it was particularly in the context of a work-life balance and you know, what I realized, I was sort of thinking about um, being a working parent and realizing you know, what are the things that I've inherited and what are the things I do differently. So it, was just, it just so happened that I was writing the book at a time when a lot happened in my personal life, um, as well as lots of external um, factors to do with you know, gender pay reporting and the equal pay route at the BBC and Me Too and Time's Up. So all of these things were, were happening that were feeding into to what I do. But I think that my whole attitude to when people see me, if people see me as a role model, I... They, know, do. Oh, they do. They do. Okay, so, so then I'm going to say when that happens, I'm very privileged if I'm seen that way or when I'm seen that way. And, I, and it felt a bit uncomfortable at the beginning, but then I realized how much I relied on, whether it was in the first career I wanted to get into, which was law or, or, or in journalism, how much I relied on people with whom I could relate in some way, people whose bylines were different, people who looked different from the mainstream. You know, um, Zena Badawi, Trevor MacDonald, um, in the newspapers, Gary Young, Yasmin Ali Pai Brown. These are names and faces that jumped out at me when I was thinking about journalism. Why did they jump out at me? You know, obviously, they looked different. And that meant a lot to me. And without them, I'm not sure I would ever have thought journalism was a place for me. So in the knowledge of what that has meant to me, um, then I understand how important it is. And I guess I do see it as part of giving something back as well. If I rejected the idea that I had anything to give to the younger generation, I think I wouldn't be acknowledging properly how much I'd benefited from seeing and hearing and reading those people. And have you found that in flying the flag for your identities, you also are a lightning rod for more criticism? I think that we are certainly at a more febrile time in terms of race and religion yes. as well as politics in this country than I, um, than I you know, would have said five years ago. And that, there, you know, there is an intensity around that that is at times very difficult. Mm. But I think you know, my answer to almost to when I feel that is, you know, the, it's not a perfect world, but how am I going to live my life? What am I going to do with my life? And then that's when your own personal choices and you know, the standards you set yourself and, um, and the way you choose to, to go about life, I think that, that's all you can do. Mm. Any questions from the audience? I'm looking at you guys so you don't feel left out. You probably feel <laughs> over-scrutinized. I know, sorry, now we're all kind of... <laughs> oh, there's one here, yes. Hi, Michelle. Um, that's very inspiring, thank you. Um, I just wondered, something you mentioned about your background and how, sort of growing up British Asian, the tendency is to sort of be modest and be, you know, step back with everything you do. How do you work with that? Well, I think in my case, I realized that, you know, um, um, those of you who are Muslim in this room will appreciate this, but you know, I get into a good university and someone says to my parents, that's great, she got into a good university, and they're like, yes, alhamdulillah, mashallah, she got into, which is all absolutely the right thing to say, but it also means that it, I found it quite hard to sort of own my own achievements because 
you know, the acknowledgement that you're part of something bigger, which I, I'm, I, I do think is really important because mm -hmm. I don't want to go around life thinking it's all about me. It, you know, I owe so much to whether it's my family, my teachers, you know, the, the organization I've worked for. Um, I think that it was a slightly harder, slightly harder thing to, to just be able to stand there and say, yes, thank you very much, when, when it was something that I'd achieved. I think I was much more likely to say that, you know, it was, you know, I got lucky or I was in the right place at the right time. And those things can all be true, but it's also true that, you know, it's also about your own achievement. And now I've realized that all those things should be acknowledged. You have to create that luck. There's another question here. Anyone else? Just stick your hand up, please. On there, okay. Michelle, um, at what point did you decide that actually you don't have to rely on gurus, that actually you yourself are good she enough at what you do? <laughs> um, and that's to say, you know, to, to, to have the confidence to say, actually, I'm good. And, yeah. you know, I am now master of my own journey <laughs> and master of my own uh, abilities. I think that, in truth, I think joining the Today program, because it's the hardest job I've ever done, it's the most demanding job I've ever done, was a really key moment in all of that. So I don't think I would have written this book uh, had I not had that experience, because it, it, I really uh, wasn't sure it was for me. And I remember when I was first, um, you know, when, when there was talk of this potential opportunity coming up on the Today program, I remember saying to my husband, um, you know, there's a possibility they might be looking for another presenter on the Today program, but I think it would be, you know, I can't imagine going for it, I think it'll be too hard. And he said to me, but if one of our children said, I'm not going to go for something because I think it'll be too hard, mm. you know, you would never let them get away with that particular comment. And it was, once I saw it from that perspective, I realized, of course, you know, that's not, that's not a good enough reason. And it, so, but I think I, in a sense, I, although it is the most demanding job I've ever done, it's also the most rewarding. And I think it's really that which marked the moment in, our, in my life where I thought, okay, you know, I'm, um, this has been this extraordinary experience and, uh, and I want to share what I've learned from it. It's a tremendously powerful job. She said what everyone was thinking when she told Boris Johnson, please stop talking, for example. <laughs> Who hasn't dreamed of doing that? Bravo. <laughs> I know that wasn't the full sentence. If you it do want to, in sentence. your defence, it was yes. The full sentence was, "Please stop talking about Diane Abbott," which who he was referencing a lot in that. <laughs> and I was trying to, you know, focus on um, on the policies the Conservatives were putting forward. So I got interrupted, which you know, I also do a lot of interrupting. So I think there was, as a, you know, I experienced it from the other side. I nearly kissed the radio. So uh, question at the back. Yes, Michelle. Um, my question is, uh, what, what do you think about the value of networks and, and networking, if you like, both in terms of if you're almost like uh, deliberate networks, work networks yeah. in particular sectors, but also maybe accidental networks, if you yeah. like, that uh, have value in terms of through voluntary work where you do something to contribute, yes. but you meet people who may or may not be yeah. useful or helpful to your career. Yeah. Value of networks. I think networking is not one of those words that you know most people have a great affinity for it sounds slightly like um schmoozy but i think that whether you call it um you know whether you have a formal or an informal network i know that you know throughout the course of my career and it, it exists much more now at the bbc um particularly between women than, than it did earlier on but i know there have been the two or three people who have been really important who i trusted right from the beginning usually senior to me you know, who I could run things past and say, does this sound like a good idea to you? And, you know, so I've had, so there has been that circle of trust at different points of people who I felt I could, um, I could rely on. I think, um, I think, you know, with the, with the workplace, nowadays a lot of people are very focused on mentoring and I think that's important. But the truth is, we need all kinds of strategies. Mm. So I would never knock any particular network. And I, and I can see actually that particularly as you rise in seniority, a lot of the very senior jobs, you know, are become word of mouth and people hear about you and they know you and they recommend you for jobs and certainly in the business world. So I think that they are important at all different stages. I think for women it can get really, you know, if you're, if you're going home to the children after a long day, it gets very hard to know whether it's worth going long to that particular, 
you know, because there's a lot that you just don't know where any of that is going to lead. So I think you have to make choices that maybe your network is based around, you know, a career change and something you want to do in the future, and maybe it's a route into, um, into, into something like that. But, you know, there's a limited amount of time and you have to make, you have to make choices. But I think one of the things I really put forward is that you make different choices at different points in time. So when I had very young children, actually, they used to go to bed at seven. I could go out without, you know, book a babysitter and go out without really worrying about them. My life right now is much, is very different because I have school age children and I really need to be there after school. So, you know, my barometer for what I say yes to and what I decline is different now than, than it was 10 years ago. And I think we have to be ready to, you know, refresh and look again at, yeah, at, at, all our, at all our choices. But it's worth saying that you were instrumental in the BBC Women's Group and have always been, you know, were the, you were there at its inception. Yes, I was, I was part of the original group of 40. Um, and this is before the, the whole letter. pay scandal and everything. So I think that's been a really important... Yeah. Um, Around the same time. Really. ...space for women to yeah. connect yeah. to yeah. each no, other. It's been very... In, you know, it's been very heartening, actually, mm. to, to, to see that solidarity and to be part of it. Were you shocked when, for anyone that's been living under a stone, the BBC was required to um, list its top earners? Were you shocked by the names on the list? Um, I think that those... I think the disclosures were really... Uh, you know, I think everyone found, you know, inside and, organize, inside, inside and outside the organisation, it was a, you know, a deep breath moment for... Um, for for everyone, uh, but you know, I I think for me it was never personal. I'm interested in organisations, and I'm interested in in how organisations work, the decisions that organisations make. And I really hoped, and I think this has happened in lots of workplaces, that lots of other employers thought to themselves, if I had to do what the BBC had to do, mm -hmm. would I be able to stand by? a list of names of men and women I employ and all the decisions I had made. Because I think if you think about it, how things look with that sort of cold light um, spotlight being shone on them, then many employers would probably feel differently about, about the choices and decisions so, they'd made over the years. So the BBC's very public agony could have that useful well, effect of making other I people hear, scrutinise From what their... I hear about other workplaces, whether in broadcasting or elsewhere, yeah. I think, you know, the, the sort of moment of reckoning has been wider than, yeah. than the BBC. Um, there was a question here. I had a question. Have we answered it? Or, oh, no, he's, he's still going. I'm just curious, um, how do you overcome, overcome the nerves that you might get every night when you go? To well, I think my major part of overcoming, and I'm not sure overcome is actually the word, because I, I, I need them to be there to some extent. You know, and the example I would give is, if I sit down to do something pre-recorded, um, it's quite hard to summon up you know, the sort of buzz that, and you know what this is like, the, that when you're actually, when the, when the lights go on in the studio and you're live, just the, the nature of it, you just have to, you know, summon up and it just kind of is that jolt of, a, of adrenaline that you need. So I do find it quite hard in a pre-recorded setting to summon up the same. But I think I, I sort of think about it that I try not to make what I'm thinking about too big. So, you know, I get to my desk and there's probably a stack of, you know, 10 briefs, um, you know, in a three-hour program, there'll be, you know, maybe a dozen, a dozen interviews. Some will be longer, some will be shorter. But, and there'll be a few that I know I really need to think about in more, in more detail. But if I sit there thinking about all of them, I will be absolutely frozen. So I tend to think about, okay, if I'm struggling with an interview, I'll basically think, where am I going to start? And, you know, and it's, you sort of then approach it in the one thing that leads to, once I know where I'm going to start, which is a really important, which I do think through in advance, beyond that, I can just think about the, then I can think about the points I just need to get to. I don't need to script those. I don't need to plot them in detail. But I think it's just think about the most immediate thing that you need to do. So if I sit there and think about the four interviews that are worrying me, I'm not going to get anywhere. But I think about, if I think about the first question of the first one, I start to get somewhere. The problem, I'm going I'm to jump back in. The problem is your job's so fascinating to everyone, and you know everybody wants to ask about John Humphreys and all of this. You know, and it's really hard not to be distracted by that. But I'm going to force us not to be distracted. I want to return to the book. We will have time for a couple more questions at the end. Um, but you know, let's let's think about what what we can get from this book. And you know, if you don't mind, I actually set up a, a hotline to uh, to our guru 
from a number of very well-known women to air their professional and personal concerns for you to give some advice okay, from the skills. So I've taken a call from a, a certain Hillary Clinton who ran for presidency. <laughs> it didn't go so well. What advice would you give her? <laughs> I think that for... Um, I think when you're talking about women in authority, and I would say this about women in politics, in broadcasting, pretty much in senior positions anywhere. I think you have to have an awareness. This is, where, this is one of those areas where I think the different ways we talk about men and women mm -hmm. are something that you need to be super aware of. I mean, how often do you hear a woman referred to as distinguished or having gravitas? or even esteemed, although I was called esteemed the other day and I got very excited about it. <laughs> but, you know, in my industry and, else, and in politics, the big beasts, right? You hear about the big beasts of broadcasting, the big beasts of the cabinet, the big beasts of politics. Um, someone told me the other day that she was going for a job and she was told they're looking for a big hitter. At which point she thought, big hitter, they're looking for a man. Mm. And it's just interesting that there are all sorts of terms we use that, when you really think about them, are just either ex generally, however much you know, we may want to think otherwise, generally exclude women, um, or just generally show that, uh, that difference in perception. And I think at the most senior levels, that can really start to come into, come into play. But with Clinton, I mean, is it possible that she had too much of the skills that she was so slick and presented and mm. people wanted something else? I think when you Did get she to actually the, do anything wrong? I think when you get to the highest level of politics, I think, you know, when you're talking about running for president, I think it's, you know, those are very unusual jobs and those depend on you are, you know, the point she makes is that people perceived her when she was, the way she says it is that when I was in service to a President Obama, I had fantastic ratings and when I was running for president myself, suddenly my ratings were very different. Now, I just, I think what, with that though, those are two very different jobs. They are jobs, you know, when, I, I think in politics, running for the very top job and even more than a prime minister with the president, that's a unique set of circumstances which I think is not necessarily comparable to okay. elsewhere. Okay, there's another caller on the line. Uh, this caller is a lady who has been child rearing for the last 29 years for her children who refused to grow up or leave home and she's feeling unfulfilled. Do you have any advice for Marge Simpson? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, seriously, um, I think that this, I've been really struck by things like returnships because I think actually there's a massive untapped potential of women out there. You returnships know, fantastic women. are... Returnships are bringing women, uh, you know, ways that can help women back into the workplace after uh, long periods of, of time away, or not even long periods of time away. The reason I think they're really important, and this I think gets stuck, uh, gets lost sometimes, is that there is evidence, strong evidence, that when, I'm going to say women because most people who are part-time are women. When you've been part-time and you come back to full-time, you are still likely to face a long-term penalty in terms of pay, that the time you spent out is likely to, to count against you. I think you're also likely to face a promotion penalty in that you will, even if you come back to full-time, you will have been seen as the person who was away, who wasn't as visible, um, who was leaving at fixed hours, and all of this can just come into, uh, can come into how people see you and, and whether they, they see you as a leader of the future or, or even part of the future. So I think that um, we really need, you know, economically as well as individually, for, for those who uh, want to get back into the, and just, you know, find it really difficult. What do you, when you've got, when you've had 10 years out of work, it does, the CV gets really hard. And I think the more focus we put on that, and, if, and even if you look at it more about the economy and what the economy needs, you know, all over the world, India being one example, but really in every advanced economy, there's really compelling evidence on how much you could add to GDP if you just made it more possible for, uh, for those who... Do you see yeah. that change happening, though? I saw, you know, the reason I think that with the right attention, it, it will happen, but only with the right attention. It's because the projections of work, just because we know how much disruption is happening to jobs everywhere, I think it will become much more common for men as well as women, you know, also because many more men are getting involved in, in childcare now than, um, than was the case before. I think that will just help make it less unusual for women to take time out of the workplace because men will be doing it as well. We have more men taking paternity leave and parental leave now. Did you ever, so, if I may interrupt, did you yeah. ever kind of downplay the motherhood thing? 
because you didn't want I don't to. Know. I'll tell you what I did do. That. I, I not downplay because it was, you know, I had three children in two years. I don't know how I could have downplayed it. I mean, I was just like <laughs> basically pregnant or giving birth for a, you know, pretty much Do you all think the they time. noticed? <laughs> well, exactly, you know, <laughs> sitting on air. I mean, when I was pregnant with twins, I was on Breakfast News and people kept writing and thinking, this baby is very, very overdue. It looks like, you know, and I was like, it's two babies, okay, that's why I'm the size I am. And, um, but, you know, people said very helpful, um, helpful things at that time. But I tell you what I did say, I remember after I went back to work after having the twins, and they're now 12, uh, I worked on BBC World, and, you know, I used to get on planes, go to... I worked on a program that was focused on East Asia, so, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore was, you know, was my beat, essentially. And, and I remember my editor asking me to go somewhere, and I said, I, uh, I can't, but please keep asking me. Because I thought, I don't... I really... I was conscious. I didn't want to downplay, or I couldn't downplay what was going on in my life, but, um, but I just didn't want him to write me off. And I remember very clearly, my twins must have been 18 months old when I was in the natural, I remember exactly where I was, but my editor, I was with my three-year-old in the Natural History Museum and my editor called me and said, Benazir Bhutto has been assassinated, can you get on a plane tonight to Pakistan? And I remember that being, you know, A, there was just no way I would ever want to say no to that because it was such a, you know, huge moment. Um, but. But I also thought, um, you know, yes, I can do this. You know, the little ones were 18 months old, my, you, know, you know, and I did go. But I'm just glad that I didn't close off doors because, you know, life, life does change and it will change. And there was a time when my hands were so full, I just thought, you know, I just, I can't even leave the house. Mm. But, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, it did change. There's one last caller on the line. <laughs> Michelle, it's a, a very successful woman who has recently faced accusations of, of losing control emotionally and uh, showing anger. What advice for Serena Williams? <laughs> oh, what advice for Serena? What advice could I give Serena Williams? I mean, she's a total, the work that she's doing to, you know, not just to raise awareness about inequality and pay for women, but racial inequality, all of that, you know, she's. Um, She's done so much for other women and for, uh, for minorities and for awareness in general. Um, I think, I don't know if I could say, I mean, I, I can't make a judgment on that particular instance and whether, whether she was facing sex. So she clearly feels very strongly that she was facing The judgment I'm looking for, I'm not asking you to judge necessarily, yeah. but the interesting point is, should she have expressed anger or sucked it up? I can't judge her because I don't know what it's like to perform at that kind of level and what, and what she's up against. And look, you know, don't we all remember how John McEnroe behaved? So, you know, she's hardly the only one who's, um, you know, who's, uh, who's, who's shown, you know, anger at that, at that sort of level. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't know about that. I think that when it comes to women in business, there's a really interesting piece of work that a New York Times correspondent did interviewing lots of women in business who had either done the top job or, or, or were the number two in their firms and were going for the do top job. And they certainly felt that at that sort of level they came up against things that, um, that their male colleagues never, you know, lots of unspoken stuff, whether it was the amount of business that went on on the golf circuit, mm -hmm. um, that there were just lots of unspoken things that they came up against that they never imagined would be the case. And that's where I think, you know, societal perceptions and all of that that's, you know, that's still out there. And that actually won't change without, without much increased is, awareness. Is the answer for women at that level to try to retain calmness and, and be better than that? Or, you know, why shouldn't they get angry just like the blokes? Yeah, of course. And you're damned if you do and damned if you of don't course. in that regard. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. You know, we should all, we should all be judged equally on, on what we do. I don't know, individual situations, I think, I guess I'm... I, I'm just not the kind of person who thinks there ought to be a license for, you know, fury and, and anger. I think lots of people, usually junior than you, pay a price if you, if you go down that route. Um, on anger, and we're running out of time, I will um, do one last quick round of questions, but I just want to ask one more thing. I want to ask about mm. online misogyny yeah. um, and, you know, talking of anger and this yeah. slightly irrational age that we appear to be entering. There's a phrase you have in here somewhere in my colour-coded notes, where you say, yes, you talk about your capacity to shrug off. I'm imagining that you've had, you know, more uh, opportunities than most to develop that capacity. Even on social, in reaction to stuff yeah. on social media. 
So, you know, I think there's no doubt that uh, I love social media. I think it's made me a better journalist, more connected with audiences, viewers, listeners everywhere, um, you know, giving me more access to streams of information I never would have uh, known were out there. But it's also an outlet for some really nasty stuff. And, Which is um, disproportionately targeted at women and uh, people of colour. That's how it feels, certainly at present. But, you know, again, my answer to most of these things is think, okay, how am I going to deal with it? You know, it's, there's a lot of nasty stuff all there. What am I going to do about it? Or how am, how am I going to deal with it? And, and, you know, on the rare occasions that I've engaged in some kind of tit for tat on Twitter, I've always looked back and thought, that's 10 minutes of my life I'm never going to get back. <laughs> so I think it is very rarely worth it especially not what I do. I mean, it, it depends on what you do. If you are a commentator, if it's your job to argue a position, that's different. Uh, you're probably going to hone your arguments by, by doing that. The only thing that has made me, um, you know, the, uh, in terms of the capacity to shrug off, actually, there was a moment which, which sort of did change my, my capacity in terms of uh, how I thought about online hate and abuse. And that was when I realized, and this was through the, the I mean, things have moved on a bit now, but. When, the, when there was a US Senate committee that first went through, uh, did the first real assessment of accounts that were linked to Russia. And they released this whole list of accounts that they traced back to uh, one particular, I think, troll factory mm -hmm. in Russia. And you look at those accounts, there was no way you would have realized that they were not real people. I mean, they, the way they tweeted, the way they presented themselves, that, you know, they looked like real people. And I thought, Actually, when I realized that most of those, at least in the Senate committee's view, were not real people and were bots, just made me feel a little bit better about what was out there. <laughs> because, mm. you know, some of it will not come from real people. It doesn't mean that there aren't nasty ones out there, but there just may be a bit less of it than it feels. Um, final chance for questions. We will come to you. We'll come to as many people as we can. Is there anyone in here that wants to add? No? Right, um, some, you've been asking for a little while. Do, just keep your hand up so we don't um, neglect you. Uh, quick question, how do you approach fake news and mm. do you think there's a gender bias? A gender bias in fake news, do you mean? As to who, is it men or women who are more active in? In producing it? Mm. Oh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say. But I think fake news has, um, in, in, you know, as a journalist, I think it has reinforced my sense of mission that I just feel, it, I guess it's, it's just given me that strong sense of purpose, stronger than I would have said was the case a few years ago, reminded me of how important, you know, credible sources are. Um, so it's, it's not great to see it out there. Uh, but, you know, fake news is only part of the problem. There's also the kind of, you know, the misleading news or the, the news that just sends people off in, uh, in directions that are, that, are, that are a total, you know, it's where the story is not altogether fake, but it's just put forward in a, really, in a really misleading way. And that's not just about politics, that's about the use of statistics and, you know, the ways in which our view of the world can be, you know, very easily um, uh, influenced in a, in a very worrying way just by the way that things are presented. And I should just add, all the more reason to stick up for the BBC in these times when lots of people are attacking the BBC. Other questions, please. But keep them short, because we're going to... Oh, we've got some questions in there. Excellent. I'll come to you next. Yes, this one. Who's got the mic? Hi. Hi. It's me. Hello. Um, I'm a trainee barrister, um, and it's, the legal field is not very diverse. It's hard for me to find good role models, especially yeah. Muslim, Pakistani, female people. Um, was that something that prevented you from pursuing law as a career or you just were not passionate about it? Well, you know, I, um, I remember that I think my, unfortunately, I, I have to confess that my interest originally in the law, I think, did have a lot to do with LA law being on television in the, 90, <laughs> in the 1980s. You were too young to know this, but some of you will know, will know what I mean. So I have to confess that that may have been my starting point. But I, I remember reading Helena Kennedy's Life in the Day um, at the back of the Sunday Times magazine when I was about 15 and I never forgot it. And I thought, wow, I like the sound of her life. Um, and so, you know, she was definitely a, a, a role model to me. Um, I did, I do remember actually though doing some work experience in a barrister's chambers and certainly I think, you know, it, it, it was certainly the kind of world where I felt, uh, I felt totally differently about it the way 
uh, compared to the BBC. You know, the BBC was just somewhere that just I would feel much more at home. But um, but I think you can find all sorts of role models. You know, you will find people, even if it's someone who, if even if you can't see the person who looks like you and has a name like you and sounds like you, always come from a similar background. I think we can find inspiration in all sorts of in all sorts of places. And actually, I interviewed the fabulous Dinah Rose um, for the book, and you know, she. She said, when she first came to the bar, she said, everything about it is terrifying, and anyone who doesn't admit to that is lying to you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to hear those messages, because otherwise, when you're up against those really, you know, those sort of environments which are full of scrutiny, and advocacy is terrifying, so many people are depending on you. You know, when you find that hard, it's not about you, it's because it is hard. And therefore, I think, you know, we have to guard against the things which make, which make us feel it must be because of my inadequacies that I find this difficult. It's really not. You've chosen a tough path, and it's a great path, but just keep doing what you do. There's a question down here. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> you can see me. Hi. Yes, just a question about self-value, because I know women are really challenged with that, and sometimes you've just got to rely on yourself and yes. your achievements when no one else sees your value. Uh, have you had experience with that and what would you say to women who struggle with that? Yeah, I think I um, yes, I absolutely have um, Have struggled with that and I think particularly there was a time in my 30s uh, Where you know, I had young children and I and I did have a job I loved at BBC well, but I was thinking you know Like if I want to present one of those big news programs one day, how am I going to do that? There are very few openings I don't really know what it takes, how do you get noticed, and there's like a handful of jobs even if you do. So it did really feel that I was up against all of that. And I think the thing that helped me was sort of really drilling down to what I truly had to offer. And in a way, you can think about it as the elevator pitch. It's like, you know, in my case, if I'm in a lift with the head of news, you know, what, am I, what, am I going to, what am I going to say? And I think that, that can help because, you know, I think, yeah, self-doubt can, can be a massive, massive problem, and it's really not helped. You may well, you know, some of us will find ourselves in a situation where people, you know, things are going wrong, and people are saying things and, to you that are going to make you, you know, they're going to, you're going to feel like they're doubting you as well as you doubting yourself. But, you, you know, you have to dig deep, because you know your worth. And buy the book. <laughs> uh, there's one question here and one question here. Uh, hello again, uh, Michelle. Um, you, uh, we talked about. Uh, I, I think. Uh, I think you were asked about uh, how it feels being an ambassador, and uh, you know, with, with the various identities that you represent. Um, I remember Aung San Suu Kyi saying two years ago. She was famously quoted um, at the end of the interview with yourself, saying, "I didn't know I was going to be interviewed by a Muslim journalist." Uh, given that the landscape uh, is different now when it comes to religion, race, and politics mm -hmm. than it was five years ago, do you think it's more tempting not to call out anti-Islamic uh, attitudes or views um, because thereby drawing attention, uh, even if paradoxically it becomes more important? Ooh. I would say that I, I think that we do not want to be a society that has normalized any kind of hate or prejudice. I think that uh, where we see that happening, and I think that there is evidence that it's happening, I think you know, we have to fight against it, because I don't believe it's what this country is about. Um, you know, I often think that had my parents emigrated from Pakistan to France or Germany or one of the Scandinavian countries, I don't believe I would have had a comparable career to the one that I've had in this country. So I feel very grateful that they came to this country where so much has been possible. But, you know, no progress can be taken for granted. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I, I feel that that is something which, uh, where, you know, we have to guard against, uh, against the normalization of, of prejudice and hate, because I think it can happen more easily than we like to admit. On Aung San Suu Kyi, I never heard her say those words. I, I, they were in Peter Popham's biography, which came out um, at least, I think, three years after, after the interview had been done. So, um, so I, I, never, I never heard them, and um, you know, she, she never confirmed or, or denied it. So I, 
that's not something that I can confirm myself. Mm. There was a question here. I think probably one more question. And then... Is this, this the last one? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. There are so many questions that could be asked, but this being the last, the final question, may I become personal? Um, what, because more personal than we've been already? <laughs> more personal. What more do you want? <laughs> it's very, very clear from everything that's listened to, you know, over the years, listening to you, you know, the Today program uh, in, in your capacity as an interview, you're, what an excellent questioner you are. What happens to the listener, however, when you are tied into you know, a particular time frame, mm -hmm. when there is a particular subtext that is political and so on that you're expected to touch upon? Because the really profound, in-depth conversations are those that also involve the listening capacity mm -hmm. of the questioner. Do you feel that in any yes. of the interviews that was something that profoundly moved you, or where you questioned yourself afterwards, you know, did you have time to yeah. listen? Or did you get to the point to say, no, the questions I initially thought of were not the questions to be asked? Yes. Well, you know, you raise a really good point, and it's, it sounds so obvious with interviewing, but it's actually one of the hardest things to do, and I remind myself of it all the time, because I don't think, I, I think it's, it's so important, you do have to remind yourself of it all the time, is, um, you know, you can be part of a conversation, and it, it is very easy not to listen properly to what the interviewee is saying, and to miss something in the heat of the moment. And at the same time as all of that, you know, obviously I always look back and think, did I ask the right questions? Did I follow up in the right way? And the truth is, um, the same, different interviewers, will take the same interview in, in different directions because the, along the way, whether it's a three minute interview or a 10 minute interview, there are judgment calls to be made right down the line. You know, you, you may just spend longer on one topic because it was interesting and then you don't get around to something that you look back and you think, I really needed to ask that person that. So there's a million judgment calls that come in along the way and you look back and you think, you know, you win some and you lose some. And I don't mean that in terms of either the interviewee wins or you win, I don't mean that. I mean. I just mean that there are things where you think, you know, invariably, I'm always thinking, should have said that, shouldn't have said that, because I'm, I'm the kind of person who wants to look back and be, uh, and learn from, from, what I, from what I do. What I've also had to learn over time is that, is to do that in a way that is sufficiently reflective, but um, where you don't give yourself such a hard time that you only see the faults and that in the worst case scenario you lose your nerve for the future because that is really important so i think you know resilience is is important so for me there's a reflection that comes first and then there's a point where you move on and you think okay i've thought about that such and such thing could have gone better might do that differently i'm now going to think about tomorrow well, we'll be counting on you not to lose your nerve over this next year, which contains so much uncertainty, no pressure. Yeah. Um, everyone is going to buy this book because it's a wonderful book. Michelle is not only a really <laughs> impressive person, but she's a very generous person. This is a really generous and useful book, so buy it for yourself or for anyone that you know. May I say one thing? These book, books... Oh, <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not just saying this, but, you know, whether it's Mary Wollstonecraft or whether it's um, Jane Austen in Baghdad, these are... These are, these are books that are full of joy, and I really wish you all the best with the campaign for getting the, the Mary Wollstonecraft oh, you're very kind. statue up, because I was in <laughs> Parliament Square when the Millicent Fawcett statue was unveiled, and it was, you know, it was, a mo it was just such an amazing, I couldn't believe how I was feeling about it. It just felt like so right to see that statue go up, overdue, but just so wonderful to be in the square that day with all these women and men celebrating. Well, so more role models. I hope, we have all a moment right. I hope like so. That. I very much hope so. But to bring it statue. back to you, that was also, again, that just shows how generous she is. Please buy the book. She'll be signing books now. We're about to hear from the wonderful charity Power. Um, so also do find out about that. But thank you very much for coming and a huge clap for Michelle. <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you, B, for asking those searching questions from women around the world, because those are the answers we need to know. And um, Michelle, your book sort of gives us the vocabulary as women 
to um, define our own accomplishments, which we find quite hard to do sometimes. And um, I think it really is a must read um, for, for all of us. And, and so thank you for being here. Um, Michelle downplayed how she got to where she is. And of course, I just have a small anecdote to share from the first time we met her and her family at a, at a resort in, in the Bavarian Alps, beautiful place. Um, and Michelle would send her kids off in the morning for skiing and, and then sit in the library. And I remember watching this and sit in the library and work. And most of us were just there having a gentle snooze, you know, sort of lolling about, and, and she would work, and then she'd be ready for her family um, to have a fabulous time. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, the work ethic, the, the, the preparedness, and, and the planning. And, and this is how she is on vacation. But, I, I, but I'm, not recommend, I'm not saying people shouldn't have holidays. I mean, honestly, yeah. <laughs> I'm really worried. It's, you had but, fun as well, but you yes, didn't. You but did it more. was because of the book. It was because of the book. We met wow. at a time when I was desperately trying to. <laughs> But it was very impressive to watch. I have been um, on holiday since, like, without, without the laptop. Well deserved. Um, but I just want to tell you a little bit about um, POWER, um, Pan-Asian Women's Association. Um, my name is Kamal Mehta. I'm on the management committee, which is very ably headed by Zehan, right here. Um, and POWER's sole aim is to support teenage girls' education in Asia. We are a UK registered charity, um, but we have but all our work, all our money goes to Asia. And, and because we're entirely run by volunteers, 95% of the funds that we raise do actually reach the girls, um, which we're very proud of. And, um, and this year, 2018, we have um, nine different projects in eight countries. Uh, we have fundraisers and events throughout the year. Do pick up one of our leaflets and, and come to something. Um, did you, it, it, all it takes is £2.50 to educate a girl for a month, um, which is quite remarkable when you think of your tuition fees over here. Um, Michelle has been a supporter of power right from the start, and uh, she, in fact, chaired an event, a literature event that we had back in 2010. Um, and she is, hers is actually the voice on the power film, which you can see on our website. Um, and so thank you, Michelle, again, for, for all the support. Um, power is, um, like I said, all we do is focus on teenage girls. And the reason we focus on teenage girls is because, particularly in Asia, as I'm sure a lot of you know, that is when girls start dropping out of school. Um, Primary education is often taken care of, but when you get to the secondary stage, there are familial pressures, societal pressures, um, all kinds of hurdles that are put in the way of girls to achieve what they have the potential to achieve. So we play a very small part in mitigating some of those um, circumstances, in helping overcome some of those hurdles. And if you can help us in any way at all, we would be so very appreciative. Um, I want to thank Sunuk, who is our head of events, for putting together uh, this fantastic event with Asia House, to whom we are very grateful. Uh, we've been in partnership with Asia House right from our launch. Um, thank you to Anna, uh, I'm not sure where she is, who is the literature program manager um, for for you know putting for partnering with us on this event. Uh, we hope to have a long and fruitful partnership with Asia House going forward. Um, and I just wanted to say um, that we are having our next event on uh, October 11th, which is the UN International Day of the Girl. Also, it mark, well, this year marks the 100 years of the vote for the women. Um, B, I think you might be interested in this, this next event because it's, it's to do with the suffragette movement as well. Um, we are partnering with Emily Matters, which is a social media movement um, focusing on, uh, on gender issues or gender inequality. And uh, we've got Kate Willoughby in the audience over here who has written uh, a play called um, For Freedom's Cause, and she, she, she stars in it as well. And um, we're going to be live streaming that play uh, on, on October 11. So please do join us. You can find more information about it downstairs. Um, at, at, yes, Sunuk, who, I mean, uh, Phyllis, who was our, our head of charities, is, is holding up the flyer, and we've got plenty more downstairs. Um, so please do come, and we really hope that this has been as informative and enjoyable for you as it certainly has been for me. Um, thank you again so much, Michelle. Thank you, B, and um, thank you, Asia House. <laughs>